Hey up and welcome to the Temple of Bleh. I'm joined by Samuel Duick of Thunderflix fame. So Thunderflix, if you're not aware, is a new streaming platform that's dedicated entirely to metal content. Uh, it includes live videos, documentaries, uh, any kind of metal content which you might see out there in the world scattered across the uh, the streaming stratosphere, Netflix, Amazon Prime. Thunderflix has got it all in one place at the low, low price at 666 per month, unless you buy it for a year, in which case you get two months free. I mentioned in this conversation, I was watching The End, the Black Sabbath final concert, uh, and I was astounded by the quality. I was really impressed. So get your, get your fucking act together. Get your act together and check out Thunderflix. One, two, fuck it up. Thanks for coming on. Uh, it did just occur to me that I've seen a couple of interviews and press releases about Thunderflix, but I haven't seen anything in the podcast format. So I was like, all right, well, this could be... And knowing that my podcast, while well, there's not a lot of subscribers, there's it's primarily the metal industry that listens to it. Um, as in, it's literally, the, it's literally the roadrunner audience. I thought this might be appropriate. So again, right. th thanks very much for taking the time. So I'm going to... I'm going to, I'm interested in your background, Samuel, because I checked out your LinkedIn when we were first connected a few weeks ago. How did you migrate from, it was music PR to marketing to the Mexican Film Festival? And then we'll talk about Thunderflix. So can you just tell, just give me a quick sort of introduction to this, this, um, your path. If that's sure. Okay. I mean, I, I, for me, it's very natural, right? I was going to college and I wanted to work and then I, you know, I don't know how I connected with Sony Music, but then I I saw there was something, and then I I said, oh, this could be a cool job, and because I you know I I, I played guitar and I was a metalhead when I was growing up, so when I I saw something at Sony Music, I became an intern. So the, I I was paid minimum wage in Mexico, which was I guess hundred and twenty dollars a month. Literally, oh. they were paying me on CDs and and because and with experience which is okay it's, it's okay it was my first job i was like 19 20 years old but i did some amazing stuff with them and i learned a little bit about the industry i wet my feet as they say who did you um, work with i worked in smi which is sony music international right. and i was in the pr department so i took for example steve by and satriani to tv interviews i took corn to tv shows I was with uh, Roger Waters and I, I was with like, you know, uh, big bands and we were, uh, we released System of a Down Toxicity, which was a huge album that year. I remember telling mm -hmm. the people there, this is the biggest metal album since the Black Album of Metallica in 91. And I wasn't far from the truth. That, that album sold millions and millions and really made System of a Down one of the biggest names in metal in that year. And uh, so I, 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 you know, it was fun. It was fun to understand the label and how it works and all these different things. And then I, I left Sony because I went to Australia to do a master's, uh, sorry, my, an exchange program. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. And I really got into marketing. I, I was enjoying the whole marketing aspect of things. And uh, I, it was the World Cup of 2002. And I don't know if you remember, Nike was killing it with a campaign about getting the best players in the world in a secret boat. And it was like an elimination and they had Figo and Ronaldinho and all these people. And, and then they managed to get that campaign to every city in the world and have tournaments. And so I was like, oh my God, Nike is killing it. So I called Nike and I said, you, you need an intern? I'll, I'll be happy to, to, to <laughs> work for you. And they said, sure. And so I... I I got hired at Nike. They, they paid me a little bit more, but I was doing a lot of work in market research and understanding, you know, their um, how event management and event marketing. And then Nike immediately knew my music and film uh, love. So they started putting me in this thing called Active Live, which is everything to do with sports that's not athletic. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Design, all the... All the cool parts of, of culture. How do we do it with, with sports? So I worked for Nike for like a year and a half mm -hmm. and I missed Australia so much that I went back to Australia to do a master's. And then I studied in Sydney for like two years doing my MBA in event management. 
Right, event management. Okay, okay. I'm seeing like there is a through line here because PR and marketing. There is kind of yeah. like a there's a DNA strand that works there. But who was yeah. who was hosting? You, it's bothering me now. Who was hosting the World Cup in 2002? Korea, Japan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I I, I completely drew a blank there. I couldn't. Remember. I was only 13, so I'm going to forgive myself. Oh wow, you're so young. All right. <laughs> I, 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 it's funny, I, my memory is not so good, but I can remember every single World Cup since 1982, Spain to 86, Mexico, Italy 90, USA 94, France 98, Korea, Japan 2002, Germany 2006, South Africa 2010, 2014 Brazil, 2018 Russia, and 2022, which was right now on uh, Qatar. Qatar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Very, very impressive. <laughs> All right. And then anyways, when I finished my master's, I needed to do an event. I wanted to do an event and I remember trying to do a music event. I wanted to do like a guitar, a guitar, like a workshop or guitar seminar, guitar festival with like live stages and bring guitarists and have like all these brands sponsoring it. Mm -hmm. But it it was very, uh, it was huge in scope. And obviously I needed a lot of money that I didn't have. So I, it was just like uh, my thesis for events. Mm-hmm. Then I, I remember I used to go to movies a lot, to movie theaters. And in Australia, I don't know why not in Mexico, but in Australia, I really got into going to like the French film festival, the Italian film festival, the Israeli film festival. And I'm like, how come there's no Mexican film festival? So I started the Mexican film festival in Australia. And it right. was a huge success because Mexicans in Australia are not Mexicans in USA. Here we're popular, here everyone knows, okay, Mexico, we're the neighbors, we're big amounts. Mm-hmm. But in Australia, Mexican is so exotic. We're just like one in a million, right? There's it's only novel. like a few. So, right. and then also it was the same year that uh, the the three amigos became popular at the Oscars, Iñárritu, Cuarón del Toro, everyone is like, oh, Mexicans are the best filmmakers in the world. And I'm like, yeah, sure. So <laughs> I contacted Mexico and we did the first Hola Mexico Film Festival in Australia. Huge success. And then in one of my vacations between Australia and Mexico, I stopped in USA and I realized there wasn't a Mexican film festival. I said, how come there's 30 million Mexicans <laughs> living in USA yet no Mexican film festival? And I'm doing one in Australia with like 2,000 Mexicans. So... I called the New York Latino Film Festival, which was the biggest. And Mm -hmm. I said, why don't we do a sideline of your festival called the Hola Mexico? And they loved the idea. We did it. It was hugely successful. So I started the Mexican Film Festival in USA. And this September, it's going to be the 15th anniversary. So that was 15 years ago. Wow, congratulations. What does it take now? Moving from, obviously, events management masters into your own complete beast of a festival representing 30 million uh, Mexicans in the United States. How, what's, what were the main challenges on getting started? And or did you find this is such a null, such a market gap that it was quite easy to pull together? It wasn't that, I think it's easy, right? But the market, the, the, the gap in the market was there. And we had the success of Australia on our backs, which meant the filmmakers knew about us, a few of them. So it was easier now to, to get good films for a festival. And also, you know, I was able to knock on the door of, you know, larger organizations. So when we moved from the beer sponsors in Australia to beer sponsors in USA and airlines. And so I have already a leg there. And that was, in a way, easier to to make it happen. But right. it, it's, still, it, it's, still, it, it's still difficult. I mean, not, right now we have amazing sponsorship from Toyota and Delta Airlines and big companies. But it's still, you know, it's still I need to... to do the the legwork it's it's not easy yeah especially in like a post covid climate where the entire events industry is taking a little bit of a tumble and it's it's it's, it's some, the dynamics are completely different correct but yeah yeah okay let's let's jump into the present day so your new right. venture i say your new venture you're still going on with hola um but thunderflex is what four weeks old six weeks old Maybe five. We started the March thirty first or March thirtieth was the first wow. day. Yes, it's been a month and a half. Wow. So okay. So my my understanding is 
and I'm I'm a subscriber, so I'm aware of the of the the shtick. But we've got a streaming platform that's dedicated to purely metal content. We've got our own. We finally have our own corner of the world. And I don't want to speak for you. You can take over after this sentence. But the 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 sort of mission statement, if I was to gleam it from just watching, I watched the, the end the Black Sabbath um, concert last night and i kept dipping into documentaries and dipping out because i was getting distracted from doing my actual work but it seems the mission statement is to take the metal content and give it actual or at least present it in a manner which is appropriate from a production value point of view because what you tend to find is metal documentaries scattered across the ecosphere sometimes you'll see it on prime sometimes you see it on netflix sometimes you'll just see it on youtube and sometimes it just looks shit and it sounds a bit shit because it's just been thrown through whatever algorithmic compression it has to go through to get onto those platforms. Thunderflix, it looks and sounds fucking incredible. That Black Sabbath concert looks absolutely fucking amazing. Like I didn't even know it was, I didn't even know they, they did a, a concert DVD. But when I saw it, it was like, oh, not only have we got slow-mo uh, little shots, we've got the great lighting, we've got it in widescreen as well. It is in 1080p. I mean, it would, it, it's just great. Like, so yeah. is that was that the point? Was it like we need a car of the world where metal projects can have their production value and and they can enjoy that they can enjoy being put out there in the in the way they were meant to. That's a long way of saying it. Well, that's that's one aspect, right? There's so many aspects of why I I envision Thunderflix to be a, a great platform. So that's one of the things, the quality. But the other thing is just to have in one place everything. Right, because as you said, you have some in YouTube, some in uh, Prime, some here, some there. So why don't we have one channel that's ours, you know, the metalheads that we can feel like our own and then put everything there. That's yeah. number one. Number two is helping labels monetize on content that they haven't monetized in decades. So right now we have a contract with AFM Records and they have like a ton of DVDs the thing that sold in the 90s, in the early 2000s, and now they don't sell, the video content is just sitting somewhere. So now we're we're getting those content, uh, those videos, and they're gonna be on Thunderflix. So, you know, when I had a dream of Thunderflix, I just, I was on my iPad and I wanted to watch some of the DVDs I have and I couldn't. So mm -hmm. I wanna have all my DVDs, you know, into, into a content platform. Now, not all the content is gonna be amazing HD like the end, because some things were shot in the 80s or 90s. Not yeah, sure. But then again, how cool to have everything in one platform and be uh, honoring the time where it was shot and the video and the quality when it was shot. So people still enjoy putting a VHS and, and watching it. Sometimes it's cool to see, you know, the, the master or the HD enhancement, which we're doing to a few of them, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. But um some things you know you can enjoy uh, and respect the time when they came from so it's it's the amount of content the concentration of them all monetizing and yeah that's uh and also in the not too distant future have amazing original content we're already coming up with some ideas to have our own films our own documentaries of the metal world because there's so many stories to be told and we we want to help be be part of that one thing I find interesting is is when you were saying about monetizing some of the content or allowing labels to handle this content, which is set, sat in some cellar somewhere. Obviously, doing the Roadrunner uh, doc, it's I'm trying to find like some of these older uh, bits of material and obviously speaking to a load of the artists, especially the ones who signed with Roadrunner sort of mid-80s, late-80s. A lot of the time, they can't get a whiff of interest from Warner or Roadrunner about getting their stuff on Spotify. So it's good that there's a platform where there's an actual financial ecosystem which can incentivize the label to go, you know what, it might actually be worth going into the cellar and pulling out this old, especially in these days, because when I was buying retail, as in like when I was buying the physical CDs, they always came with like a DVD. And I was speaking to Rick Ernst about this, who you'll know from the Get Thrash documentary, which features on Thunderflix. But he said the way it would work is you typically get like a video budget for for a band, right? So let's say um, let's say like Chimera was like doing Impossibility of Reason. You'd have like a video budget and they'd do a couple of videos and anything that's left over, they'll normally like throw into the next album cycle. So they'd send someone in to do like a documentary of the making of or do like a tour video or something like that. And that's what would get bundled in the special edition. Yeah. Now there's the, the don't 
obviously they're not sending that stuff out anymore and that stuff sort of lives somewhere in the road and the vaults but now they've got an incentive to you know put it somewhere yeah. so I, i'm just saying where we're saying monetizing these these revenue that these different bits of content it also keeps the labels on their toes which is what we the consumer want right yeah and you know we want the con- we want to see this stuff and we want labels to you know to to make money and we want bands to have the exposure and to make money as well. Mm. So why not, if, if, if it helps someone, it, it's going to help the whole ecosystem, as you said it. Yeah. That helps the culture. I use really boring, like corporate terms, like <laughs> the, the, the ecosystem and the transactory nature of this uh, industry. So what, what's, what's your dream bit of content for Thunderflix then? Is there a particular thing you're after and is it live after death? Uh, there's there's so much stuff, man. There is so much stuff. I mean, I I remember when the new Halloween Blu-ray or DVD came out with the the pumpkins united. I'm like, oh my god, how cool would it be to start with that? But uh, you know, we're getting the monumental mass of Powerwolf, mm-hmm. and that was one of my dreams. And now it's it's coming to Thunderflix in a few weeks, so I'm very excited about that one. But there's, there's a lot of stuff. There's a Sepultura VHS that was released in 92. I actually called Gloria Cavalera and she said, oh yeah, you need to speak with the Roadrunner. I'm like, um, all right, that's going to take some time. But I'm, I'm, we're here for the long run. So I know, you know, first this is going to come, then the other label is going to come. Then, you know, I'm having good conversations with many labels. Others are dismissive, but they'll all come as soon as they start saying that the, you know, the money is there. So, yeah, I mean, 666 is a very one appropriate price point but also it's exceptionally reasonable yeah exceptionally it's cheaper than a cd it's cheaper than it's cheaper than half a cd in the uk you know so in usa it's the equivalent of a starbucks cappuccino so if you can afford that maybe for 666 a month you can you know have access to all this library and then or 666 a year as well and then you get yeah, two months of course. Free. Yes, two months free. So tell, tell me about the original content then. What are the are there any ideas you can share, or is are you trying to keep it a secret? It's okay if you are keeping it a secret. It's good. No, I'll, I'll tell you because I think this is uh, if anyone hears it here, it's uh, people that are actually interested in this. So we're trying to do a documentary about you know the fans, which I think where we haven't seen too much of that, and I think we all like. You know, when we go to the house of a fan, we like to see their collection, right? Mm-hmm. Which CDs they have, which vinyls they have. And, you know, I, I don't know if you've seen on Instagram, but some people have amazing stuff and they display that in really good place. So there's, there's something there. And there's something also, another film or series about the graphic artists, the people that do the cover artwork for many of the metal uh, covers. Mm-hmm. But the, we have a very unique approach on this one, which is very artistic and very film uh, mannered. So hopefully we can take this to, to film festivals before we premiere it on Thunderflix and maybe even theatrical. I don't know. We'll see. But there, there's a few there's a few other things. And I mean, I, I would love in, in the future to do a series of Rob Halford. I read his book and what he went through in the 70s and 80s, hiding his sexuality as the biggest male dominant metal voice, that's a huge story. And I, I you know, if he hears this, so I've tried to reach him out, but he is not responsive, but I'm sure at some point I'll be able to reach him out, but we want to get the rights of his book to, to make it into a movie or a series. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. But it's so cool. Cause you are so uniquely placed to do that, you know? Yeah. It's the it's it's the one co- it's the corner of the market which is going to be exclusively catered for so much stuff, and it when as things move forward and the momentum picks up, I've just got I mean the whole mission statement for this this podcast and the whole mission statement that led to the Roadrunner documentary is kind of the theory that take your favorite band forever right take your favorite band of all time there's probably 10 bands that are better than that band but you will never have heard them because the system didn't pick them up right they fell through the net no one signed them no one heard them the drummer didn't turn up one day and they called it quits but that's the greatest band that you'll ever hear that slipped through the cracks you'll never hear from them again which platforms like this that can empower the kind of scope to capture the content and the stories and the the 
the collective experience of metal, which is the greatest genre of music all, of all time. And it, it can allow it to propagate. And I think that's, that's why it, it's got me so psyched up anyway. Right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, another amazing way of looking at it. Yeah. How many people have you got in the, in the back office there at Thunderplex? How many are, what's holding the, the fort up? <laughs> Look, it's uh, me and uh, an amazing, amazing uh, marketing guy, uh, Jason Miller. He's in London, so not too far from you. And he, he is uh, our head of marketing and he's been doing an amazing job. And then, you know, we've hired a PR agency to help us push. And there's a few other people that I've hired, you know, to do graphic design or put us in touch with labels or just different people to do different things. But at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's a very small operation for now. Right. Right. No, it's very impressive. So what's the, apart from just gathering content, is that just the, is that the next year for you just pulling things together and getting as much on the platform as possible? That and getting subscriber, getting some marketing done and putting marketing in place, affiliate programs and getting people to review our films and, and to, you know, just get subscribers and get content. That's it. How did when you first? Because it was never, it wasn't announced as like Thunderflix is coming. It was always like Thunderflix is here, which I quite. No, we, no, we did it, but you probably didn't hear about it. <laughs> it was yeah, it was. I mean, I, I saw it in a few places, but it, it wasn't like a massive. It wasn't no. like front front, play, front page of like Metal Sucks or anything like that. It was quite a soft release. Of course, oh, yeah, we because we. Um... We did. We thought, look, if we're gonna spend any energy in getting any noise make sure the platform is ready for people to subscribe because what's the the point in making noise you know like when a band releases and they said oh we have a new album coming soon immediately you can pre-order right they're, they're not mm -hmm. waiting to say oh we'll release in a year and then they'll send another link once they say like uh, thy art is more there they just announced a new album and immediately you know you can buy the album even yeah. even it doesn't come out until september or whenever it comes out but the moment they announce, the link for pre-order is there. So yeah. that's what we did pretty much. We Once we announce, okay, now you can log in. We did a little bit on our social medias and our contacts and just, you know, different things in order to to get a waiting list and, and people to be, you know, uh, fans mm -hmm. and whatnot. But yes. Well, how was the, what's the subscribe account now, if you can share that? Was it, did, did it quickly pick up or... Are we still yeah, getting that? No, I, I can't really tell you how many, uh, <laughs> but we have a plan of arriving to this number in one year, and we already arrived on that number. So it took us less than uh, two months, like a month to do what we wanted to do in a year. So that's great. But then again, you know, people are going to unsubscribe, new people are subscribing, new content is coming. So it's going to be a, it's going to be a labor of, you know, continuing pushing stuff. To, yeah, to where we need to go. Well, it sounds very exciting, and obviously, I'm aware of it because we've obviously spoken before, and I've been um, pottering around on the platform itself. Is there anything else you want to mention regarding Thunderflix before I ask you another another weird question that's going to go off on a tangent? Uh no. I mean, if I'm plugging Thunderflix, I'll just say it's worldwide as well. I don't think we we said that, but that's a cool thing. Yeah. In, like every platform, every country is different and whatnot, but Thunderflix is the same everywhere in the world. Desktop, Android, Apple. Yeah, you can download on Roku TV, on iOS, on, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Get, get bloody subscribing, everyone who's listening. Yes. I want to ask, in the interest of, um, in the interest of your, your history, obviously, with the Mexican Film Festival and obviously crossing over into Thunderflix, I'm not aware of any Mexican metal bands, apart from if you want to mention Brujeria. Well, Brujeria, yeah. of course. Then there's uh, Agora. Now, Agora, they sing in Spanish. They're like a progressive power metal band. They're pretty cool, right. actually. We're talking to them to getting their, they did live DVD album, so we're trying to get it on, on Thunderflix. Right. Uh, there's Shibalba. There's a- uh, I'm typing these out. There's, you know, I I grew up listening to metal from all over the world, but yeah, indeed, Mexico wasn't there. The only really metal band I loved was Raxas. Uh, Raxas, I don't think they ever become very popular. 
Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I'm going to get killed here by the Mexican bats because I'm, there's so many, but I just, I haven't been able to really deep into it. I mean, I love it. Uh, there's, uh, there's a few bands from Spain, okay. um, uh, Mago de Oz, which I love. And, um, but yeah, I mean, we're not Sweden or, or Finland, right? Mexico. <laughs> we are the most passionate fans and you can ask anyone who has ever played there, you know, I mean, they'll, they'll get the same with Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, but yeah, in Mexico fans are crazy as well. So. Yeah. There's a reason all the live DVDs are mm. either in, in, in South America or Mexico for sure. Yeah. I think the one thing that people have been missing and one thing is about to, I feel like we're going to get a trickle out of China of metal bands. You occasionally see like inklings, like there's an art, like an article on like an obscure metal press site or something saying these are five bands that are coming out of China. And I'm like, it feels like there's going to be loads more because it feels like where that could go is mm. super, you know, it, it I don't like I, I can't see a Chinese metal band going. Oh, we're just going to go straight down the new wave of British heavy metal, but it's Chinese. I think there'll be so much going on that there's going to be a really interesting sound coming out of there. But we'll have to wait and see because I don't know how I don't know the mechanics of getting getting Chinese metal. <laughs> I, I I there's like a movement of Japanese girl bands playing amazing metal. There's a band yeah. called Love Bites. Love bites. Okay. It's ridiculous. They sound like Halloween, but like brand new with power energy and very youthful. It's crazy. It's very good band. <laughs> You're out you are well on top of the scene, Samuel. You're much more on top of the scene than I am. I went down the rabbit hole on one particular thing and I've I'm, I'm not emerged yet, so I don't know anything new, which kind of sucks. I don't know, man. It's it's still I get to I get to be surprised because the more you figure out, the more things you find and i still i'm not a big fan of some genres i mean i'm i love symphonic metal and i love prog metal i love black metal and death metal and melodic death metal but then there's always something new that i haven't heard and then there's other like the whole hardcore uh, or genre or hardcore metal or mm -hmm. core metal metalcore it's 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 unique thing it, it seems it's it's as far removed from heavy metal than like country music is but apparently there it's it's there and it's metal and it, it, it's it's it, kind of weird I'm, my relationship with metalcore is kind of strange because like i'm a, I'm a big trivium guy kill switch engage guy like that was what i understood as metalcore and then that seemed to transition into the new wave of american heavy metal when like god forbid and lama god came along and yes. then metalcore was kind of reserved for this sound that bring me the horizon kind of cemented with Semp Eternal in 2013. Now every metalcore band now kind of just sounds like that. And it's kind of difficult to pin down what people mean by metalcore for me anyway, but then I'm an, I'm an old man. So. No, Maybe you're I'm an old man here, but anyways, <laughs> I, I really like Lorna Shore. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there, there's, there's interesting things. I like Inferi a lot and <laughs> it's just very technical. I'm, I'm, you know, a very brutal and relentless, relentless stuff. And uh, why not? One thing I, I kind of slept on was I was I was filming uh, an interview with Madball, the hardcore band, and okay. I was I was aware of Madball, but I wasn't like in deep with it. But I knew they were a roadrunner, so I was like, okay, they're playing Manchester. I'm going to go and film an interview with them. And then I, I got the hookup through Harry Abrams, who was who signed them back in ninety two or three. And I was like, I don't really know much about these guys. And they're, and he was like, they are super, like, very loud dudes. I fucking love to be on Roadrunner. You're going to have a great time. And I was like, all right, whatever. So I did the interview, had a great time. They, they came across really well, and I really enjoyed speaking to them. And then they played the set, and I was like, aha, now I get it. <laughs> and I really, really fucking enjoyed it. So it just goes to show, like, you can sleep on something 30 years later and still wake up and go, oh, shit. I completely missed this. Well, I, I, I'm not a, I'm not versed with them, but uh, I'm sure they are. Obviously, you've been a metalhead for a long time. Have you got like a, a, mo a most treasured metal memory? I know I'm being super generic here, but I'm yeah, like, no, there, there are, there are, there are a few, there are a few for sure. So when I was 18 or 19 years old, 
I was living in Israel for a year. You're and... so well traveled. Christ, I wish <laughs> I, I wish I had as much sort of worldly experience as you did. And I, 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 I was in love with the Halloween. I mean, I'm, I still am, but the Halloween became. I mean, I was mad, madly in love with Metallica since I was 13 until I was like 19. Mm -hmm. Like, but so much that I, I couldn't hear other metal bands. I just heard Metallica, a little bit of Pantera, a little bit of Iron Maiden, but it was Metallica. 90% of what I listened to was Metallica mm -hmm. and Dream Theater. Anyways, uh, at some point I heard High Life, the live album of, of, of Halloween, and I became obsessed with Halloween. It was like, oh my God, this is the best thing I've ever heard. So I'm like, I'm already this part of the world. They're never going to come to Mexico. So... I need to go see them. So I, I, I was 19 years old. I was living in Israel. I, I went on a weekend to London to see them perform live on their Better Than Road uh, album tour. Right. So and, and I remember we were walking there. I mean, I took the plane. And then on the same day, we, we bought the tickets calling on a phone. There was no internet like that. So we called them. And then we had to go to pick up the tickets from a box office. So I told to my friend, oh, let's go check the venue where the concert was going to be and the time we went there the whole band was coming in to do their sound check so i met i met them i took a picture with them it was like definitely one of my most treasured memories as a as a metal fan to to have met everyone in halloween back back then wow wow well i think it just to sort of bridge the generational gap one of mine was um probably seeing Lamb of God when they did the Ashes of the Wake tour in, in the UK. And it was like, they did two. They did one in 2005 when it kind of blew up, but they did like a tiny tour in okay. um, in December 2004, just before Dimebag got shot. Um, and they played Leeds Cockpit, which is a is a frequent um, is a frequent topic of, of, of my memories. Um, but it was kind of crazy because not only was it like Lamb of God in this sort of potently really fucking brutal time, but it was before health and safety regulations were kicked in anywhere. So we had like the two stack, the two front of house stacks, just these two, uh, two big towers of speakers in the venue with the stage in the middle. And kids would climb up to the top, jump across. And this is like, it must be, it must have been about three or four meters off the ground. So it was like, it was no joke. It was, no, no, it must be ta all, taller than that. It must be about six, seven meters. And then jump across punch each other or try and punch each other and just collapse down into the pit. And it wow. was fucking bonkers. Wow. And now I, now I, I treasure that memory at the time. I wasn't treasuring it at the time. I was like, what the fuck is going on? But now yeah. I'm like, yeah, fair enough. It was a simpler time back then. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> have you got any shows? Um, have you got any tickets to any shows coming up or, uh, oh, plenty always. That's the, the fun thing of living here in Los Angeles. We always have shows. So actually I have, a. Uh, I'm going to see Chemis with Wake right. uh, in a few weeks. Then we have Emperor. We have Halloween at the YouTube Theater. Mm -hmm. um, we have Haken. Yep. Haken is playing with Arch Mathos or something. I don't know. Uh, but I love Haken. Haken is such an amazing progressive metal band. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we have... What else? There, there, there's a few others. There's always a few bands that... Uh, they're, they're, oh, I think Neo Blizzard is from Australia. They're coming and playing here too. I'm and between, at the Buried, between the Buried and me are playing in the summer some at some point. So I'll, I'll definitely try to catch all of those. Busy. I'm looking. I'm just looking over my calendar. I was like, what have I got? Because I, I saw Cannibal Corpse the other week. Um, because I did an interview with Ingested. Oh, um, Ingested are a good one. You want to check out them. Um. Slam Dunk Festival is coming up, and that's in Leeds. So Slam Dunk is like a it's like a punk and pop punk festival. Um, so No Effects are playing, and I think that's that one of their last shows. So I'm like, I've got to go see that. Okay. Um, then there's Download. I'm not doing Download. I might go for a day. What about then, Bloodstock? Bloodstock, I might. Um, Bloodstock, I've got a very soft spot for. So Bloodstock. Every time I attend Bloodstock. My phone, my wallet, and my keys go into a locker. And then for like the three or four days I'm there, I've just got my health. And I just spend the entire thing in a complete oblivion, just going to see bands, drinking. That's Last amazing. Time, yeah, no, it was great. It's so good. It's like, I don't know. It's like, it's, a, it's the dump valve for the soul. 
It's where you flush all like the bad energy out because you've just there's no accountability. You're just getting hammered and watching metal, and it's like oh. that for four days. But so, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm tr- I, I know Bloodstock. Bec- I, I met the, the 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 owners and the the people that manage it. They're still it's a, still a family event, and they're very passionate. And th- we want to work with them with Thunderflix to do something with Bloodstock. So yeah, no, it's a good shout. It's one of the bigger. It's an interesting. It's got an interesting place with Bloodstock because they kind of did like the indie metal festival thing outside of Donington, outside of Monsters of Rock and Download. And it kind of grew organically like Wacken did in a weird way. It's kind of like a weird, I see it as kind of a weird sister to, to Wacken. Um, it might, I might be the only one that sees it that way. But I first went there in 2007 when it, the stage was like just one tiny stage and the headline act, I know there was more than one stage, but it was like the, the main stage wasn't massive at all. And one of the headline acts was Chris Slade from ACDC, uh, formerly of ACDC, playing with an ACDC cover band. And that was like one of the last acts on one of the evenings. Wow, it was ace. So yeah, this is right. back in the day. Um, who else played that year? Testament played, Copy Clarny. Um, oh, Copy Clarny had fun. Copy Clarny was great. Yeah, Epica. Oh, man. Yes, love Epica. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know who else played that one. <laughs> I don't know. See, I'm getting lost now. I'm getting lost in the detail. I'm happy to wrap this up, mate. If there's anything else you want to talk about or plug. No, it's so good. Thank you, man. No, I very much appreciate it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back